right, it's Friday, and one piece of news making headlines today is the U.S. gross domestic product data from the Commerce Department showing the economy is slowing down. It grew 1.5 percent in the second quarter on an annualized basis, and this is down from 2 percent the prior quarter and 4.1 percent the quarter before that. Consumers are reportedly cutting back spending on big ticket items. Businesses are holding off on investments. So in light of this number and these, this data, cue speculation about the Federal Reserve taking more action or cue talk of how government GDP numbers aren't reliable in the first place. Also, how this so-called recovery lags compared to others. But when did things really start going downhill economically in the U.S. stepping back? Was it after a peak of good times for America in the late 50s to mid 60s with the 1959 Cadillac, a relic of a bygone era, not just of iconic tail fins, but of a decent standard of living for Americans that was not yet built on unsustainable debt to make up for stagnant wages? Or was this what sealed America's fate back in 1971? I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets. Forever severing the link between paper money and the precious metal. Nixon there closing the gold window, devaluing the dollar, essentially ending Bretton Woods. Those are a couple of the reference points. The Cadillac, the gold window closing that my next guest has named before as turning points for the U.S. Doug Casey joins us from Vancouver, where he's there for Agora Financial Symposium. He's founder and publisher of Casey Research and author of books including Crisis Investing, Opportunities and Profits in the Coming Great Depression. And we're so lucky to have him. Thank you so much for being on the show. Well, it's my pleasure indeed. Thank you, Lauren. It's really my pleasure. So I just set up a couple of reference points that I've heard you name in interviews that the late 50s and 60s with the 1959 Cadillac is symbolic, uh, 1971 when, when Nixon closed the gold window. So on a day like today when GDP numbers come out and people are evaluating where the U.S. is in terms of an economic recovery, where do you see it and, and when do you see a, a pivotal moment in the U.S. economy looking at kind of these markers that you've laid out? Well, there are a lot of places where you can start, uh, but uh, the average standard of living uh, after taxes, after inflation, in real terms of the average American worker has actually been going down, flat to going down, since the early 1970s. Insofar as it appears to have been getting better, it's because he's been taking on huge amounts of debt. But uh, bringing it more up to current time, I believe that uh, a real depression started uh, in 2007, 2008. And as we speak right now, we're just in the eye of the hurricane. We've gone through the leading edge of the hurricane in 2008, 2009. Uh, we're in the eye of the storm right now. And we're going to come out the other end. And it's going to be much more serious and last much longer than what we saw and be different than what we saw in 2008. Uh, the only reason that we're in the eye of the storm is because these governments, not just the United States government, but governments all over the world have created trillions of currency units that have papered this over, but it's temporary. Mm -hmm. So as far as what you're, what you're talking about, and you've said we've entered something before called the greater depression and you're, and you're naming 2007 kind of as this pivotal year 2008 and, and 9 as the years following that where, where things are really bad and now we're in the eye of the storm. You say we're going to come out of it but it's going to be difficult. So what does this look like? Do we see another 2008 repeat? Well, I, I think the one thing that you can be, you can absolutely plan on is financial and economic chaos. Now, uh, from a monetary point of view, does that mean that we're going to have a catastrophic deflation if banks fail, the stock market collapses, bonds default. That's possible. But the government's going to fight against that the only way that it can by creating more currency units. So the odds favor high levels of inflation, maybe much, much higher levels of inflation. And this economic that we're now facing is much worse than what we had back in the early 80s when you may recall we had interest rates of 15 18 percent even on treasury bills mm -hmm. 
uh, those high interest rates in those days encouraged people to stop borrowing, stop consuming, and start producing and start saving. And that's why we recovered as strongly as we did during the early 80s. But now the government is keeping these interest rates at artificially low levels, which is encouraging people to consume more, to borrow more. So it's, it, it's going to be quite ugly, I think. Okay, I want to get a little bit more into this because on the note of, of central banks printing, if we do have another crisis, another 2008 type scenario, would central banks be able to reinflate the economy, do you think? Because we've seen a lot of money printing and, and, and we know that it doesn't necessarily get out. They, uh, the central bank can't control where that money goes. And yet we see uh, central banks have record balance sheets, but a lot of that money that they've pumped out into the economy or tried to has just ended up right back at those central banks in the form of excess reserves. So what do you think the chances of of, uh, are of a reinflation of the economy in a crisis scenario. Well, you're quite correct. Because of the nature of fractional reserve banking, uh, the way the money supply really expands is through loans given to individuals and corporations by the banks. But in this kind of an economy, people don't really want to borrow. They're too afraid to borrow. And at the same time, the banks are afraid to lend. So that's why that, that, that's happening. But nonetheless, uh, those dollars have been created, and they are eventually going to go out into the economy. In addition to the fact that uh, there are now about seven trillion U.S. dollars outside of the U.S. held by foreigners, and these people don't have to use dollars in trade from day to day. Uh, they view them increasingly as hot potatoes, and at some point, I don't know what the catalyst will be. They will start dumping them wholesale, and uh, they'll start coming home. And uh, just as in the past, we exported those dollars. We printed paper, and the nice Germans gave us Mercedes, and the Japanese gave us Sony's coming in. In the future, when those dollars come back into the United States, uh, the Boeings and the wheat and the titles to land and the corporations are going to go out, and the dollars come back in. And uh, that's uh, going to result in a very serious uh, decline in the average American standard of living, much more than we've seen recently. Is there any silver lining in that, in a crisis scenario where the economy does bottom out, that we can take from, from lessons of other countries that have experienced defaults, such as Argentina or Russia or Iceland? Is, is there any good part of this? Well, look, there's always a silver lining to everything. Uh, the government creating these trillions of currency units and causing even more distortions with more laws and regulations uh, these things cause tremendous distortions and misallocations of capital in the economy. This is very bad for the economy as a whole. Uh, but for speculators, uh, and a speculator is somebody who capitalizes on politically caused distortions, it's a good thing because there are going to be lots of bubbles created. So people that are hip to the way the financial markets work should be able to make a lot more money. Well, that's good news for them, or I should say for us, but it's once again more bad news for the economy because, uh, as always happens, when the state takes control of an economy or when there's a lot of inflation, uh, the rich get richer right. and the poor get poorer and the middle class gets ground between the millstones of taxes and inflation. Right. Bad news for, for average folks, good news for people that can capitalize it perhaps in, on it perhaps in financial markets. In light of that, I'm just really curious because you wrote Crisis Investing in 1979 and it was a bestseller. How does crisis investing compare now to, to, to when you wrote that book originally in 79? The economic principles are identical. <laughs> and anyone that read that book today, the first three chapters are about economic principles. Uh, they're not boring, actually. They're, it's quite interesting. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, uh, well, most people don't think of economics as being at all interesting because the way it's taught in high schools and colleges, it's, it's boring, irrelevant, and mostly wrong. But uh, if I were to rewrite that book today, I would keep the first three chapters on economic principles the same, but the world has evolved technologically, politically, militarily, socially, so I'd have to rewrite the, right. The last. But basically, the, the principles are the same. It, it's just a different set of circumstances. That's interesting. In terms of bubbles that you mentioned, and bull markets do often end in bubbles, uh, what would you look for in the future in order to determine whether or not we've reached this point with gold and other precious metals? 
Well, the key thing about gold is that it's the only financial asset that's not simultaneously somebody else's liability. It's not an investment mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't produce anything, just like a, a pile of dollar bills on the table doesn't produce anything. It's an asset. Well, of course, the dollar bills aren't an asset. They're actually a liability of the U.S. government, uh, which is manifestly bankrupt. But uh, I expect that there will be, in the future, a bubble develop in gold, uh, generated by both fear and greed, as people try to get out of these uh, uh, disastrously depreciating currencies around the world. And uh, there's going to be, uh, they're going to pile into gold. And there might be a super bubble in the shares of stocks that uh, mine it, uh, which are uh, traditionally a highly leveraged way of uh, playing with gold. Interesting. So I want to talk more about gold miners and also about what would change about your calculus if gold was made into a monetary metal. I want you to hold right there if you could. We're going to go to break, but we'll be back in a few minutes with Doug Casey, founder and publisher of Casey Research. And still ahead, we'll catch up with Dimitri, who has been in Vancouver all week for Agora Financial's Innovate or Die conference. As it wraps up, he will debrief us on how hopefully to innovate and not die. But first, your closing market numbers. We just put a picture of me when I was like nine years old on To Tell the Truth. Confession, I am a total ghetto princess. I love rap and hip-hop music and Christian music. I thought he was kind of a dick yesterday. I'm very proud of the role that Al Jazeera has played. You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. drives the world. The fear mongering used by politicians. Who makes decisions? Considerable breakthrough has already been made. Who can you trust? No one who is imbued with a global missionary zeal. Where are we heading? State controlled capitalism is called fascism. When nobody dares to ask, we do. RT question more. Welcome back. Before the break, uh, our guest and myself, we were getting into gold uh, as an investment. I want to bring up something that he mentioned. He was talking about gold and gold mining stocks. And gold has far outperformed gold mining stocks with returns of 471% to 233%, as you can see in that chart on your screen. So let's talk a little bit more about why this is. I want to bring back in Doug Casey, our guest today, to get his opinion on this because he is an expert in this area. Now, Mr. Casey, I know this is an often asked question, a common question, but I do want to ask it. Why do you feel that gold miners have so underperformed the physical metal during this bull market? Because mining is basically a crappy business. <laughs> this is why, I mean, really, uh, I, I've been in and around the mining business for most of my life. And uh, the, the price of the commodities uh, fluctuates radically. Uh, the ore reserves you have in the ground are unpredictable. When you're looking for more resources, it's extremely hard to find them and unpredictable. And if you find them, you have no idea if they're going to be economic. This is why uh, 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 Benjamin Graham and, for that matter, Warren Buffett wouldn't dream of investing in a mining stock. It's uh, inherently speculative. It's not a predictable growth business. And mining has becoming much, much harder and much less profitable in recent years, primarily because of 
regulations. Uh, and also because, as with oil, all of the easy to find deposits, the low hanging fruit all over the world has been found. So the only places where you can go are politically dangerous and unstable countries or exotic deposits that are deep or very low grade. It's a tough, tough business. That's the problem. Uh -huh. Partly technical and partly just technical geologically. And the other thing is, is we shouldn't refer to gold as an investment. Mm. It's an asset. Mm -hmm. An investment is theoretically something that produces new wealth. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the climate of fear that we have in the world today, uh, people don't want to take risk. They want to have an asset that's not simultaneously somebody else's liability. And that means gold. Right, right. And along those lines, though you do predict a bubble, I'm curious how uh, it would factor into your analysis if gold was made into a monetary metal, if, if laws changed and, and gold could be monetized, would that make the bubble less severe when it bursts? Would that, would that change kind of the whole calculus surrounding gold? Well, gold is a monetary metal. It is money itself uh, for the, actually, this has been the case uh, since money was first developed. Uh, Aristotle in the in the, the, the fourth century BC uh, gave the four thing the five things that you have to have for a good money. It has to be durable, divisible, convenient, consistent, and have value in and of itself. Uh, so this is why it's not it's not uh, witchcraft. It's not uh, barbarism. Why people use gold for money? It's simply common sense. And this has been known for centuries. Uh, all these currencies uh, that are floating around in the world today, they're just pe pieces of paper. They're all going to disappear in the future. Mm -hmm. And in the future, the people that have the gold, when gold is once again used in day-to-day -day commerce as money, not necessarily passing coins around, it'll be digital, representing specific amounts of gold in deposit, uh, they're going to be the big winners. So I uh, urge people to have a significant portion of their assets in gold today. Okay, interesting. And and when Ben Bernanke catches up to Aristotle, then that gold will be uh, worth something a little bit different than maybe it is right now. I'm curious. The Agora Conference, our producer tells me that a lot of the the, the people there are U.S. expats that have chosen to live outside of the U.S. or buy homes outside of the U.S. Not because they're looking for a vacation, but they're, because they're looking for some financial and individual safety. I'm curious what that means to you in terms of uh, the potential that people see in the future of the U.S., both as physical but also human capital, leave the country? Well, uh, and uh, I want to compliment you on having said the U.S. Uh, a lot of people say America, but America was a concept, and a, an excellent concept, a unique concept. But I'm afraid uh, America is dead now. It's gone. It's been replaced by the U.S., which is just another of 200 nation states uh, covering the face of the globe like, like a skin disease. Uh, there are a lot of uh, Americans that are leaving the U.S. today, and the reason for that is they recognize that your biggest risk today is not market risk, although there's plenty of market risk. Your biggest risk is political risk, mm -hmm. and you have to be diversified politically so you don't have all your assets under the control of one government because any government will treat its subjects like milk cows. And if they think they have to, they'll treat them like beef cows. So uh, there's an increasing trend on the part of Americans to get their assets out of the U.S. while it's still possible, because it's getting harder and harder uh, to get your assets out of the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and you're, you're critical of, of government and, and wary of political risk. You've described yourself as an anarchist. I just think it would be helpful for our viewers because some people may think of anarchists as, as people in black throwing rocks through windows at Starbucks at G20 protests but I, and, and may have negative connotations. Before we go, tell us why anarchy is positive in your view and how you even define that. Yes, well, uh, an anarchist is simply one that believes not... Look, an anarchist believes in society. An anarchist believes in order. An anarchist simply doesn't believe that anybody has the right to rule anybody else. So there's no uh, necessary violence or anything like that. Uh, sure, there are violent anarchists, just like there are violent dentists or violent Christians, for that matter. But it has nothing to do with the essence of the philosophy. 
Anarchism is actually the most peaceful and gentlest of philosophies. It's the watercourse way. I'm a libertarian uh, anarchist, which means that I believe in free minds and uh, free markets. And uh, most of the people that you see running around in black throwing rocks, these people aren't anarchists. They're just violent goofballs. It has nothing to do with <laughs> anarchism, which is an unjustly besmirched uh, uh, philosophy. Well, thank you for I setting mean, us straight, and thank you so much for being on the show today. We really appreciate all your analysis. That's Doug Casey, founder and publisher of Casey Research.